Hello again, this is Johnny Foote. Glad you're with us. Glad you joined me. This is the third month of our tape club. How God is using efforts of the tape club to bless so many, many people all across the country. You would be surprised at the letters that I get. Encouraging me to keep on with the tape club, that it's a blessing to so many people. And I, you don't know how I appreciate all of the cards and all the letters that you that you send to me and telling me that, that my efforts here with the tape club is a blessing to you. I want to be quite honest with you. This is, this is not a money-making thing. This is not a part of my ministry to where I have to make a lot of money with. This is a part that God just really laid upon my heart that I may could be a blessing to somebody through the tape club. It doesn't take much of my time. I just steal off by myself once in a while, just once a month, get my thoughts together and just, just be very informal with you and talk about the goodness of the Lord and how dear He is to me and what He's doing in our lives together. And God is taking this and He's using it. And I thank the Lord that He's honoring our efforts. Thank you for joining us this month. I want you to listen to the song that I've chosen for you uh, for the month of August. I recorded it uh, maybe two or three years ago, I believe it was. But uh, it was a song that everybody was singing. And the message is so true today that, that Jesus Christ is about to step out from behind a cloud and command old Gabriel to blow that trumpet and he's fixing to call his church home. That's just exactly what this song says. It says, Gabriel, blow your trumpet because here comes the saints of God called. Here they come. I trust it'll bless you.
praise God, and here they come. Let me tell you something, people. I'm in that bride. I am going to be one of these days caught up in the air to be with the Lord Jesus forever and forever and forever, and that blows my mind. I love to think of that. This song goes right along with what I want to deal with this month. I have been involved in a study course of the book of Revelation. And uh, it's a home study course that I've been reading and, and studying and, and just really finding out some things. And a dear sister over in North Carolina shared this with me. And uh, I'm so glad that she did because I have been so enlightened with this home study course of the book of Revelation. I want to share with you, beginning with chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, the marriage of the Lamb and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to get your Bible. I want you to turn to the 19th chapter of Revelation. Now, I want you to sit down and read that first. Before I say any more, I want you to read that. I want you to shut off the tape, sit down, and read the 19th chapter of Revelation. Okay, you've read the 19th chapter. Now, if you hadn't read it, it's going to be all Greek to you because you have got to study and you've got to listen. This has got to be fresh in your mind for you to, to, to really penetrate it. Some people say Revelation is hard. Some says they can't understand it. Oh, baloney. You can understand it if you study the Word. Now, let's, let's begin. Chapter 19 begins with, After these things, denoting another event in the unfolding panorama, a glorious, long-awaited, heavenly event preceded by, the, by, by all of the alleluias of the glorified saints praising God for His righteous judgments. Now, that the great harlot is judged and destroyed, the true bride awaiting in heaven can now be brought forth in all of her beauty. She is arrayed not in purple and scarlet bedecked with earth's ornaments, but in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. 19, verse 8. John, no doubt overcome with spiritual ecstasy, writes, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Revelation 19, 7. The Lamb's wife is the bride. 21, 9. The true church, all born again, glorified saints of God is the bride. Hallelujah. The marriage of which no details are given. No details are given about the marriage in Revelation. The marriage is a heavenly event taking place on the eve of Christ returning to the earth to rule and to reign in righteousness. The bridegroom is the Lamb the Redeemer who loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5.25 In the New Testament, the church is the bride of Christ, the marriage of the Lamb, the blessed consummation of God's purpose in the Beloved. Christ, in the character of the Lamb, acknowledges and takes unto himself as co-heirs of his throne all those chosen ones who have been faithful in their betrothal and now as the, as the Lamb's bride reign with Him and share His blessed inheritance forever. Hallelujah. I get so excited when I think about this. This glorious event is the consummation of the divine purpose in this present age. 
with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, it was announced that God, at the first, literally, for the first time, did visit the Gentiles to take out of them the people for his name. Acts 15, 14. The taking out of a people is distinctly the work and purpose of God in the present dispensation of grace. The outcalling of the church, an assembly of hell-deserving sinners redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, is the eternal manifestation of the infinite grace of God that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding righteous riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2, 7. Now let's go a little bit further and let's, let's look at the marriage supper. The marriage supper is found in chapter, in Revelation 19, 9. The, ma- the marriage supper, according to traditional arrangement, follows the marriage. So it is that they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb are the invited guests. The guests are naturally distinguished from the bride. The question, who are the invited guests who attend the marriage supper with the special blessing of God? That question is still debated among many theologians. One seemingly logical answer is that the guests are the Old Testament saints. For no one was baptized into one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 13. Galatians 3, 27, 8, before Pentecost. Now you look that up and you read that for yourself. It suggested that John the Baptist, who died before the crucifixion of Christ, will be a guest at the supper as a friend of the bridegroom. For regarding his own relationship, John says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom that standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. John 3, 29. This should give light to part of the question. Jesus, the bridegroom, testified, Among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. He is not, however, by his own testimony of the bride, but the friend of the bridegroom. Of this we are sure. They are, they are all redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, whether looking forward to the altar of the slain Lamb of God in anticipation or looking back to the eternal sacrifice on Calvary's cross. And all are called blessed. For the angel says in Revelation 19:9, these are the true sayings of God. Now let's go a little bit further. Revelation 19:11 through 16. This talks about the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in glory. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Here we realize clearly the full import of the title of of our study that we're talking about right now, the revelation, the actual appearance, the personal appearance, a literal manifestation and unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is revealed to mortal view when every eye shall see him. In 2 Thessalonians 2.8, Paul speaks of that wicked one whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy the brightness of his coming. John beholds heaven opened for our Lord's glorious descent with power and great glory. Matthew 
2731. Now, when I call out these scriptures to you, stop that tape, get your Bible, and read what I'm doing, or this study is not going to do you any good. You read these scriptures as long as we're studying this, this, this work. Matthew 24, 27, 31. John beholds heaven open for our Lord's glorious descent with power and great glory. As the heavenly attendants assured the watching disciples at Christ's ascension, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Literally, bodily, and visibly, so shall he descend from heaven in like manner glory. The manner of Christ's coming is revealed as twofold in character. Now, I want you to listen to this very carefully. What I'm saying is Christ is coming back two times. He's coming for his church the first time, and he's coming with his church the second time, and between the twofold purpose of this glorious event, there will be a relatively short interval during which mom momentous and climactic, climactic events will take place both in heaven and on the earth. The pivotal points of our study around which all revolves are, number one, John beholds a door opened in heaven and a voice inviting him to come up hither. Number two, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Number three, this is chapter four, begins the third division of the book. The first division was the things which thou hast seen, chapter one. The second division was the things which are, chapter 2 and chapter 3. The third and prophetic division was the things which shall be hereafter. Everything from chapter 4 to chapter 22 is divinely predicted to be fulfilled after the church is taken from the earthly scene. Let me repeat that. Everything from chapter 4 to chapter 22 in the book of Revelation is divinely predicted to be fulfilled after the church is taken from the earthly scene. Thus, the opening of the door in heaven has closed association with the rapture. Then followed the momentous events and the outpouring of God's wrath upon the rebellious earth dwellers until in chapter 19, verse 11, again, John sees heaven opened. Now read that. Read that in your Bible. This time, to publicly make manifest the King of kings and the Lord of lords descending from heaven with power and great glory accompanied by his glorified saints and the holy angels. Hallelujah. Thus, the first door open, the, 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 the first open door in heaven is suggestive of Christ coming for his people. And the second time heaven is open, Christ is coming with his people. And in between, momentous events occur that have to do with judgments. Up to chapter 19, the judgments have been directed from heaven with the angels carrying out their execution. Now Christ descends to earth in person for the final execution of judgment upon the Satan-inspired conspirators and the leaders of the darkness of this world. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. This, we're told, is the righteousness of the saints. Then the qu this question may arise. How did we get to heaven to return with the Lord? The answer is like any other army. They were mobilized. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. Thus, there is no mistaking their identity. Absolutely, you cannot mistake the identity. They are the ransomed, the raptured church of the firstborn, the bride of the Lamb, now returning to the earthly scene with her Lord as warrior, judge, and king. There are no bucklers, shields, or armor, for with glorified bodies likened to her Lord, Philippians 3.21, Romans 8.17, Earth's carnal weapons can harm them no more. That's found in 1 John 3, 2. The coming king rides with regal majesty upon a white horse, verse 11. He came the first time meek and lowly riding upon an ass, but his glorious, his marital charter is symbolic and majestic Righteous and justice, hallelujah. He whose vester is dipped in blood bears the only weapon against the accumulated weaponry of the armies of the earth, a sharp sword, in verse 15. By the sword, which proceedeth out of his mouth, they perish, verse 21. Now, chapter 19, verse 17, 21 speaks of the battle of Armageddon. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, Revelation 19, 17. Standing in the sun, where he could be seen by all. The angel invites the ravenous birds in the heavens in anticipation of certain victory by the king of kings to come and eat the flesh of kings, horses, and all men great and small until they are filled with their flesh. And I, John speaking here, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against his army. That's found in verse 19. The greatest combination of powers of earth and hell ever witnessed is gathered to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, Revelation 16, 14. War against God and his Christ. Now, take note again. Who is enraged in the conflict? The beast. The Antichrist, acclaimed by the world, its invincible leader with the combined armies of the kings of all of the earth and their opponents, he that sitteth upon the white horse and his armies, which were with him in heaven. This war, unlike all other wars, is not an array of nation against nation, race against race, but the gathering climax of God's declared enmity of, of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the serpent, Antichrist and his followers, and the seed of the woman, Christ and those that are his. No details of the battle are given, for actually there is no battle. We're simply assured that the Lamb shall overcome them, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Isaiah 11, 4, Revelation 19, 15. The sovereignty of the earth already decreed the mind and purpose of God, Psalms 2, is settled forever before three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell. The bloody holocaust of World War I was designated by deluded optimists as the war to end war. But soon the earth staggered under other bloodbath unequal to bar barbarism and lust for power. There will not be peace until the Prince of Peace 
shall come in righteousness to make war. When Christ comes to meet the satanic trio's army, its armies in open and conclusive conflict, this will be the only war in which blood-soaked history of the world, in which the outcome will abolish war forever and forever and forever in the earth by God's sacred promise, Isaiah 2, 4. Now here's a part of Revelation that I dearly love to read and to study. The fate of Satan and the beast, the Antichrist, was taken and with him the false prophet. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone which was prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. The self-acclaimed God, whose worshipers held to be invincible, the leader of the God-defined world order and commander-in-chief of Earth's amassed military might, energized by Satan, is now taken, and none can help him. He is cast down, never to arise again, and with him the false prophet who worked satanic miracles and was the personification of all ecclesiastical evil and heresy. They were cast into the final hell, the place of eternal damned, into which none have yet entered until the final judgment of the wicked dead at the great white throne, Revelation 20, 20, 11, 15. The remnant of earth's armies were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, and all of the fowls were filled with their flesh, a banquet supper indeed for all of those vultures. Revelation 20, 1, 3. This is my favorite. I believe of all revelations, all the, all the verses in Revelation, I believe that the 20th chapter is my favorite. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now listen to what I'm saying to you. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key, the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should, should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed for a season with the two infamous leaders consigned to their doom, and the slain of the remnant of the armies becoming carrigan of the fowls of the air. There is yet other malignant powers. He who is the instigator of the mad conspiracy to make war against the king of kings, the old age deceiver of men and nations with whom God at last deals in righteous retribution. The principal character is the mastermind behind the world's blasphemous, blasphemous rebellion against the only mediator be between a loving God and a sinful man. 1 Timothy 2.5. Read that. Satan bent on thwarting the, the seeding of the woman from becoming king of all of the earth is seized and bound and cast into the pit, laid hold upon. Hallelujah. Although Satan is a malignant spirit, he is also a personal devil. The key and the chain by which he is bound, even if, even if symbolical, signify the sovereignty of God over the dominions of, of the pit and, the, and, and either regions. Thus ends 
the present Satan-dominated world system. Thank God we're going to win in the end. The earth at last shall be free from Satan's sinister presence and deceptive influence for a thousand years. It only remains to tell of his final prediction. Fulfilled. Now, in chapter 20, verse 7 and 10, I want you to stop the tape right now and read Revelations chapter 20, 7 through 10. Now, you've read it. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And at the end of the thousand years of peace on earth under the direct and righteous administration of the King of Kings, Satan is loosed for a little season. And immediately his evil influence is manifested once more among the nations. He quickly fans the old age flame of revolt against God and his Christ. It must be remembered that the subject of this millennial kingdom are not glorified beings as the saints of the first resurrection. Therefore, those born during the millennium will have the same anatomic nature as their, as their fathers, but without the external source of temptation, the evil power of satanic, uh, satanic suggestions. While Satan is confined to the pit, man, the earth dweller, is as a keg of dynamite with the spark to set it off. But with Satan loosed from his prison, the spark of right rebellious hate torches off the last desperately mad attempt to dethrone the king of kings and, God, and, and deport God's purpose for, of a kingdom of righteousness on earth. But persistent rebellion against God is death. But persistent rebellion against God is death. That's worth repeating. God's answer to the rebel's last defiance is told in one short but terribly conclusive sentence. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Revelations 20, chapter 9, uh, 20, Revelations 20th chapter, 9th verse. And the devil that deceived them were cast, was cast into a lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever, Revelations 20, 10. With the last rebellion put down and the earth for the first time in human history populated with, the, with only the righteous, the great arch enemy is literally fallen and defeated and his blasphemous ambition to be like God found in Isaiah 14, 14 is, and now meets his final and everlasting prediction. The long-awaited sentence is swiftly executed. He is cast into the lake of fire already prepared by him and his blinded and deluded followers. Thus ends the last rebellion of a creature against his creator. Now I gotta stop. I could go on and on with this study. This is this one of the greatest Bible studies that I have studied in a long, long time. I may continue next month, picking up uh, the uh, about the judgment of the wicked, uh, the wicked dead, and then turning on over to the to the judgment of the great white throne and the eternal state, the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and all of these things. I may continue this study next month. I don't know. God may change my mind. But people, I am so glad that my Bible teaches me that the devil is going to be defeated. I'm so glad because I get so tired of him giving me continual problems. I'm glad that God is going to defeat him. Hallelujah. Father, we want to thank you tonight. We want to praise your holy name. Oh, God, I love you. I worship your name right now. Thank you for your word. 
thank you, Lord, for this lesson that I've learned tonight. I pray, God, that this tape will be played over and over and over and over and over. And those people that have never learned and listened and studied the, the, the book of Revelation, I pray, God, that this little Bible study that we've just touched on will enlighten them and help them to see that we're going to win in the end, that we cannot give up, that the devil may give us problems, but you're, that you're going to send Jesus after us, and Satan's going to be bound, and we're going to win. Hallelujah. I love you tonight. I praise your holy name. Take this ministry, God, and use it and multiply it. Bless that listener that's listening tonight. Father, I pray that you would bless their ears, that you would open their minds, to be receptive to the word of God that they've just heard. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. It's in your precious name that I pray, and I shout the victory everlasting. Hallelujah. Amen. I hope you enjoyed that half as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. just thrills me to death to know what's going to happen. Thank the Lord. Isn't it great to know what the future holds for us? I want to scan over the month of July and tell you what a great month that I've had. I believe it's the best month that I've ever spent on the field for God. July the 6th, I was at Huffman Assembly, and um, probably all of you people at Huffman, uh, I hope you're as excited about what's going to happen as I am. I can't hardly wait till August the 10th. Now, I'll let you people that don't know what's going to happen, maybe you've read it in the newspaper, I'm going to be at Huffman Assembly in Birmingham, Alabama. Every Thursday night, Brother Dan and Brother Bob and I uh, are going to film the TV program called Guidelines, and we're just going to join our efforts together and work together at Huffman Assembly. I'll be there every Thursday night in Birmingham, so y'all come out and hear us sing, and you never can tell what's going to happen over at Huffman. I really enjoyed it. Of course, I was at East Point, Georgia, the Joyful Noise. I had another great time there. And uh, over in Raleigh, North Carolina, at Middlesex Church of God, Lord, we had a good service over there. And it's down at Joy to the World Restaurant at there in Tarrant City, down in Birmingham. Had a good crowd. It was sold out. And I could just go on and on. I was in Dallas, Fort Worth, at Northside Assembly. Had a great service with the Galileans. Went to Abilene with Mr. Nolan and the Galileans. Then I went back to the Atlanta area, Philippi Baptist Church, and saw all of my good friends at Philippi. Then I got to return to Augusta at Victory Baptist Church and had another great service there. And then July 30th, Grayson Valley Assembly in Birmingham. What a service we had there. Four or five people accepted the Lord as their Savior, and I just praise the Lord for it. Get your calendar. Get your pencil and paper. This is the schedule for the month of August. For the month of August. Thursday, August the 3rd, I'll be in Jackson, Tennessee at the Civic Center for a benefit for St. Jude Children Hospital of Memphis. There'll be several gospel groups there Thursday night, August the 3rd at 8 o'clock. Friday night, August the 4th, I'll be in Day, Florida at the Day Community Center. Day, Florida, August the 4th. Saturday, August 5th, I'll be in Atlanta, at the Assembly of God Tabernacle. Brother Bray is the pastor there. That's in Atlanta, Georgia. It's the Assembly of God Tabernacle. August the 6th. I'm really looking forward to going back to Montgomery at First Assembly of God, Sunday, August the 6th. That begins at 6.30. Brother Barker is the pastor there. Tuesday night, August the 8th, I'll be in Milan at First Assembly for the Milan Section Count Meeting. Brother Vaudy Lambert. Superintendent for Alabama will be bringing the message. That'll begin at 7.30 Tuesday, August the 8th. Thursday night, August the 10th, will be my first night at Huffman Assembly, and I can't hardly wait. Uh, Tommy Thomas, the, the music director, called me the other night. And we're all excited about the concert that the choir and I are going to give, so all of you people in the Birmingham area, be sure that you're there August the 10th. We're going to have something special. Friday night, August the 11th, I'll be at the First Assembly of God of Dirks, Arkansas. Brother John Fannin is the pastor. Saturday night, August 12th, I'll be in Pickens, South Carolina at the 
and I don't know whether I can, uh, let me, I tell you what, I, let me spell this. I can't pronounce it. It's S-E-C-O-R-E-A Assembly Building. So now you folks around South Carolina, around Pickens, you know where that is. I don't. I can't pronounce it. That's Saturday night, August the 12th. I'll be there with the Hemp Hills. For more information, you can contact Betty Gilstrap there in uh, Pickens, South Carolina. Saturday night, August the 12th. Sunday, August the 13th, I'll be in Tuscaloosa, Alabama at Double Portion Baptist Church. Wednesday night, August the 16th, probably the highlight of my career. I'll be singing in Kansas City, Missouri at the Assemblies of God National Church Growth Convention in the Convention Center. I can't really say how honored I am to be singing on the, on the program. Reverend Roy Hawthorne will be the speaker that night. Then Thursday night, August the 17th, be right back at Huffman Assembly. Friday night, August 18th, I'll be at Stony Creek Free Will Baptist Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Saturday night, August 19th, I'll be in High Point, North Carolina at the First Assembly of God. Sunday night, August the 20th, I'll be at the Bible Temple Church in Cowwood, South Carolina. Reverend Tim Howell is the pastor there. Thursday, August 24th, be right back in Birmingham at Huffman Assembly. Friday night, August 25th, I'll be at the First Assembly of God in Winfield, Louisiana. Saturday night, August the 26th, I'll be back in Birmingham, Alabama at Lipscomb Church of God. Sunday night, August the 27th, now there, I'll either be at Sweet Home Baptist Church or the Pentecostal Holiness Church there. There is, I, I, I'm really not for sure where this, uh, where I will be. But to know for sure, contact Linda Allman in Albemarle, North Carolina. Her telephone number is area 704-982-6132. Linda can tell you where I'm going to be. There was a mix-up in, in the times or places or wherever, and I know I'm going to be in the Albemarle, Charlotte uh, area, so uh, you people up in there come out and see me. Call Linda, and she can tell you where it's going to be. August 31st, be right back in Birmingham at Huffman Assembly. Friday night, September 1, I'll be at Woodvale Baptist Church in Rock Hill, South Carolina, not too far out of Charlotte. Saturday night, September the 2nd, I'll be in Baker, Florida at Shady Grove Assembly of God. Brother Julian Walker is the pastor. Saturday, uh, Sunday night, September the 3rd, I'll be in Union City, Tennessee at Evangel Temple Assembly of God. Reverend J.T. Brown is the pastor. Thursday September the 7th. Now, I'm going to go into September now. I'll give you a few of the September dates because maybe some of you won't get your tape in time to, to be there. So I'm going to go into September and tell you where I'm going to be. Thursday, September the 7th, be at uh, Huffman Assembly in Birmingham. Friday, September the 8th, I'll be at Red Bank Baptist Church in Lexington, South Carolina, not too far from Columbia. Saturday night, I'll be in Rome, Georgia. I'm looking forward to going to Rome. I'll be at First Assembly of God there in Rome, Georgia, Saturday night, September the 9th. Sunday night, September the 10th, I'll be in Pickens, South Carolina at the Free Gospel Holiness Church. Roy Knight can get to give you all the details about that. Thursday night, September 14th, I'll be right back at Huffman Assembly in Birmingham, Alabama. Friday night, September 15th, I'll be in Jemison, Alabama at the Oak Hill Church of God. Saturday, September 16th, I'll be at Honey of Path, South Carolina, Pentecostal Holiness Church there. September the 17th, Sunday afternoon, I'll be at Mulberry, Arkansas, at the First Baptist Church. Brother Bill Spears is a pastor. Thursday, September the 21st, Huffman Assembly of God, Birmingham. Friday, September the 22nd, Cartersville, Georgia, at Victory Temple Church. Saturday, September 23rd, I'll be at the new Good Shepherd Assembly of God Church in Owensboro, Kentucky. We'll be filming that program, WOC Television Network will be filming that program. Sunday, September the 24th, I'll be at the First Assembly of God in Asheboro, North Carolina. Thursday, September the 28th, right back at Huffman. Friday, September the 29th, I'll be at the First Baptist Church of Portageville, Missouri. Brother Buck Morton, a dear friend of mine, is the pastor there. 
Saturday night, September the 30th. I'll be at Edgefield, South Carolina, near Augusta, at the Con Con Congregational Holiness Church. Brother Newsom is the pastor. Sunday, October the 1st, Union City, Tennessee, First Assembly of God. I believe it starts at 2 o'clock. Thursday, October the 5th, Huffman Assembly, Birmingham. Friday, October the 6th, back to Montgomery at Westside Assembly of God. Saturday night, October the 7th, I'll be in Birmingham at the new Joy to the World Christian Restaurant. And if you haven't made your reservations, you be sure you make your reservations because we're going to have two programs that night. There wasn't room for everybody before. Uh, he sold out three weeks in advance, so we're going to go back and we're going to have two programs. So you call him for the Jim Bedslow. So and uh, make your reservations at Joy to the World Restaurant in Birmingham. Sunday, October the 8th, will be in Charleston, South Carolina, at the Church of God of Prophecy. Going to Massachusetts, up in Taylor, Michigan, through October. Going to Prestonburg, Kentucky, through October, and I'll tell you more about the dates. Joyful Noise in Atlanta, Georgia, is October the 28th. Be sure you make your reservations quickly. That's a Saturday night, and they'll go fast. Saturday, October the 28th, East Point, Joyful Noise. I believe that uh, that's about all. The people in Mobile, I will be back at First Assembly of God on November.